we're going to focus on something getting talked about a lot these days, impeachment. It's one of the most consequential decisions a legislature can make, but more importantly, it's also an anagram for pinch me meat, which is, <laughs> interestingly, the sentence that got the lucky Charles leprechaun me too <laughs> Now, ever, ever since this president got elected, people have been dying to see him impeached, sometimes literally, as this oddly upbeat Inside Edition clip shows. Two people who passed away recently died happily after being led to believe President Donald Trump was impeached. According to the obituary for Corliss Gilchrist from Des Moines, Iowa, loved ones told him before he died that Trump's impeachment process had begun, so he would rest in peace. Further west in Oregon, loved ones say this man, 75-year-old Michael Elliott, passed away peacefully last month as soon as they told him Trump had been impeached. OK, OK, so first, great music choice there to cover two old men dying. Perfect tone you set. Although, I will say this, that's actually a sweet gesture from their families, but why stop there? Hey, Dad, we all love you very much, and we just wanted to tell you Donald Trump has been impeached, arrested, registered as a sex offender, stuffed into a tie by Robert Mueller, and rolled into the Potomac River. He got so dizzy, he cried and hurled and shit himself all at the same time. They got it all on camera, and now it's a meme. Anyway, have a good death. <laughs> Goodbye. But... But the question of impeachment hasn't just been employed as effective hospice care. It's become a major talking point among House Democrats, with a rising number coming out in favour of it. 63 of them now support an impeachment inquiry, and some, like Representative Rashida Tlaib, have gone even further. We're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the motherfucker. <laughs> Wow, it is <laughs> genuinely startling to hear that language from a congressperson. I'd almost sooner expect to hear impeach the motherfucker as an edgy new slogan for peach iced tea. Oh, Snapple, <laughs> you were always the nice tea. This isn't you. <laughs> But not everyone in the Democratic Party is quite as motherfucking enthusiastic <laughs> about the whole impeachment idea. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has repeatedly attempted to apply the brakes to an impeachment inquiry, claiming the country is not behind it, and that, in fact, they barely understand what it actually means. Do you know most people think that impeachment means you're out of office? Did you ever get that feeling, or are you just in the bubble here? They think that you get impeached, you're gone. And that is completely not true. It's not the means to the end that people think. All you do, vote to impeach, bye-bye, birdie. <laughs> it isn't that. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> I mean, Na Nancy Pelosi knows there. There is simply no better way to connect with the average working Joe than by referencing a Broadway musical from 1960. <laughs> Also, if this situation were to be a musical, it wouldn't be Bye Bye Birdie. It would obviously be Greece, where a rapey guy with weird hair treats women like shit and yet somehow gets everything he's ever wanted. <laughs> but I will say, it is true that many people don't fully understand what impeachment involves. So we thought that tonight might be a good time to discuss what it is, why it may be warranted, and what the risks might be in carrying it out. And let's start with the fact that, as Nancy Pelosi just said, impeachment in no way guarantees a president's removal from office. In fact, no president has ever actually been removed through this process. Two presidents have been impeached, Clinton and Johnson, but remained in office, and Nixon actually resigned on his own before the House could finish impeaching him. Sort of like an Irish goodbye if Nixon didn't also hate the Irish. <laughs> Very basically, here is how the impeachment process works. Typically, it begins uh, with an inquiry in the House of Representatives, during which a committee investigates and holds hearings into a president's conduct. And if a majority decides they found impeachable offences, they vote to impeach. But that is not the end. That merely moves the process to the Senate, where a trial is held. And the president is only removed from office if a two-thirds majority votes for that. So... What is the case for putting this president through that process? Well, the Constitution says grounds for impeachment are treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanours. And that last phrase can trip people up, even people who might really want to research its exact definition. There was no crime. You know, it's high crimes and, not with or or. It's high crimes and misdemeanours. There was no high crime and there was no misdemeanour. So how do you impeach based on that? OK. OK. Clearly, high crimes and misdemeanours doesn't literally mean there has to be both a big crime and a little crime. <laughs> oh, well, well, the president's committed murder, now we just need to catch him urinating on the side of a wah-wah, and we got him. No, that's not... 
how anything works. Because, because the fact is, high crimes and misdemeanors can include acts that are not actual crimes. It is a broad term for serious misconduct. And Congress is currently looking into a wide range of Trump's potential misconduct, from uh, campaign finance violations uh, to whether or not he's used his office to enrich himself. But one area where we already have considerable evidence against Trump is obstruction of justice. It's a very serious allegation. It was among the articles of impeachment approved against both Nixon and Clinton. Obstruction was also half of Robert Mueller's report, in which he laid out 10 potential instances of it taking place. And we clearly don't have time to get into all 10. So let's, let's just look at one involving Don McGahn, who was Trump's White House counsel. You might remember him as well as the understudy for Brett Kavanaugh during his confirmation <laughs> hearing. He was ready to jump in if Kavanaugh ever cried himself into an early nap. McGann's appearance in the Mueller report got a lot of attention when it first came out, primarily because of one eye-catching quote. Former White House counsel Don McGahn, he refused to ask Rod Rosenstein to fire Mueller and threatened to resign instead after the president asked him to do, quote, crazy, uh, using a word that I can't use on TV. The word is shit. <laughs> uh, the word in question is shit. Don McGahn said the president, and I quote, asked him to do crazy shit. <laughs> And it, it's frankly amazing that in a time when norms are crumbling left and right, we are upholding the norm that Ali Belshi can't say shit on MSNBC. <laughs> Though I guess, I guess that does actually make sense. Kids love the Velsh. There's, <laughs> there's nothing four-year-olds love more than watching him on TV and repeating everything the Velsh says. <laughs> but, but that phrase, crazy shit, actually became unhelpfully distracting because the fact the president's lawyer said a naughty word kept people from focusing on the details of what Trump actually asked him to do, which many argue amounted to flagrant obstruction. Trump asked McGahn to have Robert Mueller, the person investigating him, fired. Specifically, according to McGahn, under oath, Trump told him, Mueller has to go, adding, call me back when you do it, then calling him back and asking, have you done it? <laughs> so... This is clearly something very important to Trump. It wasn't something he said casually, like, Robert Pattinson should not take back Kristen Stewart, <laughs> she cheated on him like a dog, or my favourite part of Pulp Fiction is when Sam has his gun out in the diner and he tells the girl, tells the guy to tell his girlfriend to shut up. <laughs> tell that bitch to be cool, say bitch be cool. I love those lines. <laughs> no, no, this was something Trump was really serious about. But the potential obstruction didn't stop there, because a second instance Mueller cited came after news broke that Trump had tried to remove Mueller. And Trump tried to get McGahn to put out a statement denying it, and also said he wanted McGahn to write a letter to that effect for our records. So, to recap there, it seems the president obstructed justice, then obstructed justice again to try to obstruct the investigation into his obstruction of justice. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I know, I know that this might seem like a legal technicality in a couple of phone calls that didn't go anywhere, but here's why this really matters. But for Don McGahn, Trump might have stopped an investigation into himself. And if a president can shut down an investigation, he can basically do anything with no consequences. It's a big big deal. The problem is, this has been in the public record for nearly two months now and has failed to make much of an impression. When Justin Amash, the, the only House Republican to come out in favour of impeachment so far, held a town hall where he explained his decision, at least one of his attendees was genuinely shocked to hear that Trump might have done anything wrong. I was surprised to hear there was anything negative in the Mueller report at all about President Trump. I hadn't heard that before, and I mainly listened to um, conservative news, and I hadn't heard anything um, negative about that report, and he, President Trump had been exonerated. Yeah, that's what'll happen when you mainly listen to conservative news. It's like if your only source of information about O.J. Simpson is his new Twitter account. Yeah, <laughs> that's real. The juice is on Twitter now. And if that was your only source of juice news, you might not understand why this first video that he posted is so alarming. Now, coming soon to Twitter, you'll get to read all my thoughts and opinions on just about everything. So, this should be a lot of fun. I got a little getting even to do. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! What does getting even mean for OJ? When you kill two people, you're even. Three people, you're odd. Four people, you're even again. Is that it? I don't know. But the point I'm making is, if that's the only place you're getting your OJ info, your response to that video might be, OJ looks great. He's 71. Whatever he's been doing, it works. <laughs>
but, but that woman is by no means alone. The truth is, most people are simply never going to read a 448-page legal document. That is presumably why Congress has been trying to have public hearings, to get that information out in a way that might resonate with people better. In fact, McGahn was called to publicly testify last month, which could have been very powerful, and I'm guessing that's why this happened instead. Former White House counsel Don McGahn was a no-show at a House hearing today after the president insisted he not testify. Democrats had hoped to hear from former White House counsel Don McGahn. Instead, they were faced with this empty chair. Great. So Democrats tried to have a hearing, but instead had Passover. They put out a chair for a guest who didn't arrive, and most of America had no idea that it happened. <laughs> and, and look, there is a real argument to be made here for concentrating Congress's investigations and the public's attention into one impeachment inquiry. So why not do it? Well, Nancy Pelosi might argue that impeachment is not popular with the public, which is, to be fair, true. Polls consistently show a majority of Americans oppose impeachment proceedings, although it is not quite that simple. Remember, most people don't even know what is in the Mueller report, and numbers can move as people learn more. Look at Nixon. In hindsight, his resignation seems inevitable, but in the early days of the scandal, there was real public resistance to his removal. Many more things are bothering America than Watergate. I think they make a big fuss over nothing. Nothing has been proven illegal about anything he's done, and I think he's... He's on the right track. Yeah, exactly. For a while, people thought that Watergate, the scandal that we now use as shorthand for every political scandal, <laughs> didn't matter. And, that, and that's shocking to watch, although, to be fair, in the 1970s, they also thought that shag carpeting was attractive and that Liberace just hadn't met the right girl yet. <laughs> that, that decade had a lot to learn. But... But, but a Nixon outcome is not the only model. Many Democrats worry that things could instead end up like the Clinton impeachment, where the public wasn't really on board with impeachment from the beginning, and, and they never got on board, and, and not only did Clinton survive, his party gained seats in that year's midterms. That is what Democrats are scared about here, that, that impeachment could end up strengthening Trump for 2020. Although, for any Democrats whose main concern is that pursuing impeachment could be the reason they lose in 2020, please relax. It is just one of many ways <laughs> that Democrats could lose. Maybe Trump is caught on tape saying the N-word, but then two weeks later, Elizabeth Warren accidentally calls a veteran a veterinarian, and people get twice as angry about that. <laughs> There's so many ways that this could go wrong. So... So, for, for so many people here, that the key calculation is, would the benefits of impeachment outweigh the risks? And, look, that is just impossible to say. It's impossible to say how a Trump impeachment would play out, although him leaving office is extremely unlikely. That that would require 20 Republican senators to vote against him. And even if they did that, there is still no guarantee that Trump would actually leave. He basically told us as much out loud. When you look at past impeachments, whether it was... President Clinton, or I guess President Nixon never got there. He left. I don't leave. There's a big difference. I don't leave. Yeah. <laughs> of course Trump wouldn't leave. You think he'd hold a press conference and bashfully say into a camera, I was wrong? In what reality would that happen? <laughs> then he'd gracefully say, I, I would now let someone else be the president? You're insane! <laughs> then what? He'd pack a suitcase and walk, physically walk, out of the White House? <laughs> and just not be the president anymore? No! He'd make us drag him out like an uncooperative toddler. You know this. You know that's true. And, 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 and if you're thinking, well, if he's unlikely to go, then what's the point? Well, it might be helpful to stop thinking of this in purely binary terms. You know, if the president goes, well, that's a success. If he stays, it's a failure. Basically, it's Nixon or it's Clinton. That's a false choice. It's like saying you can only be Hufflepuff or Slytherin. Excuse me. <laughs> Gryffindor and Ravenclaw are right there, and, in my case, Snogglebargle. That's... <laughs> that's the fifth Hogwarts house that's exclusively for cowards. Because... <laughs> because when it comes to impeachment, there aren't just two outcomes. Even if Trump is not removed, which he probably won't be, the process could shine uh, a light on the contents of the Mueller report, uh, potentially lead to new revelations about Trump's conduct, and force his Republican allies to choose publicly and on the record whether or not to hold him to account. And you might well say, well, even so, opening an impeachment inquiry is just too risky. And I do get that. I've gone back and forth on this myself for that very reason. And to be honest, the thing that's tipped the scales for me is remembering that not opening an inquiry comes with consequences too. Because it essentially sends the message that the president can act with impunity, 
which is a dangerous precedent to set, not just for future presidents, but for the current one. Just this week, he was asked about Don Jr's failure to alert the FBI when Russia offered them intel during the campaign, and his response was appalling. Should he have gone to the FBI when he got that email? Okay, let's put yourself in a position. You're a congressman. Somebody comes up and says, hey, I have information on your opponent. Do you call the FBI? I if don't it's think... coming from I'll Russia, tell you, what, you do. I've seen a lot of things over my life. I don't think in my whole life I've ever called the FBI. In my whole life. I don't, you don't call the FBI. This is somebody that said, we have information on your opponent. Oh, let me call the FBI. Give me a break. Life doesn't the work FBI that The FBI director says that's what should happen. The FBI director is wrong. OK, there is so much in there. Let, let's break this down into three pieces. First, I don't think in my whole life I've ever called the FBI is a truly insane thing to say. <laughs> no, people usually don't call the FBI, except when they're in a very specific situation that clearly requires them to do so. That's kind of how that works. I have never called Emilio Estevez. <laughs> As a general rule, in one's everyday life, one does not call Emilio Estevez. But if I found a wallet on the street with Emilio Estevez's driver's license and contact information, I'd fucking call Emilio Estevez <laughs> because that's what the situation requires. OK, so... Second, let's take his give me a break, life doesn't work that way. It is genuinely fascinating to watch Trump project his own immoral awfulness onto the rest of humanity. Oh, so you see a baby stroller about to roll down a hill and what, you're gonna stop it? Give me a break, life doesn't work out that way. You stand there, you watch and you laugh. Everybody knows this and everybody agrees. Give me a break, give me a break on that one. And, and, and fin finally, the FBI director is wrong. He's basically saying laws are a matter of opinion and you can trust your Uncle Don on this one. But of course that is not true, which is why the head of the Federal Election Commission put out a statement reminding all of us that it is illegal to accept anything of value from a foreign country in connection with the US election and when foreign governments seek to influence American politics, it is always to advance their own interests, not America's. She tweeted that statement out with a note reading, I would not have thought that I needed to say this. <laughs> and that kind of sums up where we are in the Trump presidency. All of those things we wouldn't have thought we needed to say, we need to fucking say them now. <laughs> and as if that weren't bad enough, Trump then engaged in a little thought experiment of what he would do if he found himself in the same situation all over again. Your campaign this time around, if foreigners, if Russia, if China, if someone else offers you information on an opponent, should they accept it or should they call the FBI? I think maybe you do both. I think you might want to listen. I don't, there's nothing wrong with listening. If somebody called from a country, Norway, we have information on your opponent. Oh, I think I'd want to hear it. You want that kind of interference in our elections? It's not an interference. They have information. I think I'd take it. OK. <laughs> f f first of all, let's address that Norway. It <laughs> It continues to be telling that when Trump tries to search his brain for the best country he can imagine, <laughs> it goes directly to the whitest country he can imagine. <laughs> but, but more importantly, that is the president openly inviting foreign interference in our elections again. A and I know that we've all become numb to Trump by this point, but moments like that really shock you out of your stupor and make you think, oh, oh, oh hang on, that guy's got to be impeached. We've got to impeach him. A and look, should Democrats uh, let House investigations play out a little further before they make a move? I don't know, maybe. There's an argument for that. That strategy certainly paid off during Watergate, but later can't mean never, because the case for inaction here is starting to get pretty weak. And yes, public opinion is currently against an impeachment inquiry, but if Democrats think opening an inquiry is genuinely the right thing to do, then it's then incumbent upon them to work to change that opinion. I know it's easy to be defeatist here because nothing has seemingly reigned Trump in so far, but I will say this. Every arsehole succeeds until finally they don't. Again, 18 months before he resigned, Nixon had a sky-high approval rating of 67%. Harvey Weinstein was winning Oscars until one day he <laughs> definitely wasn't. <laughs> James Holzhauer was stealing all of Alex Trebek's money until someone <laughs> finally put a stop to it. Respect the spirit of the game, James, you <laughs> fucking monster! <laughs> Look, I, I can't guarantee that impeachment will work out the way that you want it to because it probably won't. But that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing.
Because if nothing else, we'd be standing by the basic fundamental principle that nobody is above the law. And in doing so, it would mean that when people tell dying relatives that we're doing everything we can to hold this president accountable, at least this time, it would actually be true.